Welcome to the Potion Podcast, your raw look at the hospitality industry, brought to you by SHC. What is happening, Post Shifters? Welcome back to another episode of the Post Shift Podcast. Of course, I'm your host, Sean Sewell. Um, if you haven't noticed, I've been live streaming a, a hell of a lot just because I've been trying to keep up with uh, other people's schedules. So I've been really just focusing on when I can get people. So if you've been noticing that I've been streaming every morning this week, that is correct. I have been streaming every morning. But these episodes roll out on the podcast if you prefer audio over the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking to my next guest. He's been on the show before many, 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 many years ago. Um, and uh, I think I say it every time I always say, um, I still get giddy, like a, a 29 year old Australian kid who lives in, a, in uh, Canada, whenever I get a chance to chat to, to people like this. So it's not today we're talking to Jim Meehan about his new book, the bartender pantry. And I gotta say, man, like this, congratulations. This book is fantastic. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Sean. You know, um, so for the for the listeners out there who well everybody's going to know you because you are Jim Meehan, but uh, what, what's your backstory? How did you get into the game? You know, I started bartending in college. Um, I had a, a friend, Andre Wright, who was a high school friend who went to the college I went to, and he was working the door at um, a bar that then is having a great time, and I needed a job, and that's that ended up being my. <laughs> inauspicious entree into the bar world what were you doing what were you studying for in university i'd always wanted to be a doctor um oh. and so at the time i was working at the bar and volunteering at a local hospital and taking math and chemistry classes and doing my pre-med requirements and about a year and a half into like being you know studying with really smart pre-med kids and and volunteering at the hospital and working at the bar, I sort of, and getting, and really struggling to keep up with the the classwork, I realized that I kind of love what I was doing in the bar. I also realized that nurses did what I thought doctors did, um, so that what I thought being a doctor was, wasn't exactly what it was. And I had this realization, you know, like as a kid, you're told as a college student many times by old people who you're suspicious of, old people like me, um that these are like the best years of your life mm -hmm. so make sure you like you know enjoy them but also uh you know work hard whatnot and i remember thinking like this kind of sucks like i'm i'm memorizing these organic chemistry flashcards and struggling through these exams and like i just don't get the schoolwork and i was like looking at the split screen of my life between that and my bar work and i was like working at a bar is fun. And, and at that point I started exploring this idea of, um, of happiness. And it's, it's funny, like my last book, the last, um, speaking of Australian people, um, Georgia Van Teel, Nick Van Teel's um, non-bar world wife, I interviewed her for the book because she was keeping Nick alive at the time. Mm. And, and also is like a, a bit of a wellness and life coach. And she had it. I pulled a quote from her that that I think I was dinged in a book review for. But like, <laughs> it sounds hokey. But this idea of happiness is something that is. It sounds like once again like uh, something an adult you know who you're suspicious of told you. But this idea of happiness was something that as a 23 year old I was I had my eyes on that prize. And so, to make a long story short, like I chose bartending, and I think my you know, the last 25 years have really been figuring out how to back my way into how is bartending as valuable to society as being a doctor? And the answer to that question is obviously it's not, but it's not that it's, you know, black and white. I think that what bartenders and bars do for our society is something that is maybe not as um, widely recognized, but it's, it, they are healing in my mm -hmm. opinion. It's the intangibility. It's the intangibility of what a bar does. It's funny that you said you got dinged in a in a book review about a quote at the end of the book. At least they read the whole book and and read all the way to the very end before they got that quote. And then they're like, "I'm going to write a review about this." I appreciate all you readers out there, <laughs> even the ones that don't like the work. <laughs> so your last book was the Bartender's Manual, which I sort of always equate to being like the modern day Harry Johnson. Like it it had 
recipes. It talked about personality. It talked about all these different cultural elements in the bar, including like bar layout. Like you had some very, very well-known, famous cocktail bars from all over the world and their bar layout, which was very, very cool. Um, and I think at that time, because you released that in 2017, 2018, 2019, mm -hmm, 2017. yeah. Um, that sort of personally revolutionized the way we were looking at the bar industry again. And then with this one, like I said to you in the green room, like this one's your new one. Which when, when did you start writing this one? Almost right after, like I, I, the idea for it came up came up while I was on tour for the manual. So the seed mm. for this book came up in around 2018, and then I got to work. I think Bart and I got to work out in 2019. So what inspired you to do it? I was sitting in a bar on book tour with the last book and I saw a bottle of flash pasteurized lime juice thawing on the back bar of a bar cosplaying as a craft cocktail bar. And I've told this story many times, but the grumpy mixologist in me was like, what is that doing here? Take that away. And the new age dad in me was like, well, maybe they don't know. Like maybe, mm. you know, like maybe no one told them, maybe, you know, maybe this has to do with, you know, many things. And so I decided at that point, you know, as upon reflection, I leaned on the new age dad and, and I made the sort of hypothesis that like, you know, it'd been 20 years since Dale DeGroff had gone out and mm -hmm. sort of really taught the world about the importance of fresh squeezed juice. And during that time, we've, we've experienced climate collapse and, you know, food technology has really kind of gone through the roof. And so I felt like the Dale's sort of uh, binary of like fresh squeeze versus sour mix needed not to change. I actually completely agree with Dale still after writing this book, but I think it needed uh, nuance and texture. And I mm. also think that 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 sort of idea that that Dale sort of planted in me, which was that like the non-alcoholic ingredients in our drinks matter, like a chain being as strong as its weakest link that needed to be expanded to include all of the, or many, most all of the ingredients in the drink, not just the juice. Mm. Cause you don't really talk about the spirits whatsoever in the book. Like you got the cocktail recipes, but really, cause I think a traditional cocktail book is the, the non-alcohol ingredient is just that specific non-alcohol ingredient. So it'd be a specific sugar for that cocktail. And you, you'll have the prep recipe for that cocktail, but it's not exploring sugar in general. Correct. Like, yeah. The, the point of view and, and the point of the focal point of the book is like basically just looking at the whole thing from the other mm. side. So how long did it take you to write it? Cause I know I've sat in a couple of your seminars now at Montreal cocktail fest, that sort of thing and listen to you. Like, it seemed like you, every time you thought you were finished, you were like, ah, no, I'm, I'm not really not. We could go a little bit deeper on this one. We can go a little bit deeper on this chapter. How long did it take you to write and get it all together? So, the biggest challenge was the book was completely sort of, you know, the book proposal was, was written and sold before the pandemic. And so but the original book was really supposed to celebrate sort of like the, the most culinary, some of the most culinary folks in the bar world mm. and really was attempting to, my theory of the cocktail Renaissance was that it was um, it had a mom and the dad and the mom and the, I think that we've, and historically, we tend, which, which part of it has to do with the fact that our history is written by, um, is our history is written by people who would rather drink at bar bars versus mm. restaurant bars. But I would say that like the the cocktail as we you know have it today was its parents were both kind of lounges that sort of became neo speakeasies and restaurants that that adopted culinary practices in their drinks programs. And I thought that, you know, going back to underexposed and overexposed narratives, I thought that the narrative on the lounge side of it, the social experiment and the sort of style of it has been written many, many, many times. Like my PDT cocktail book is very mm -hmm. much one of those books. Whereas like there wasn't a book that really took on the drink as a culinary art. And I, so I was really writing that book. And then the pandemic, shut all bars and restaurants down. And there was a big doubt in my mind that this type of bar, A, would exist again, or that it would exist the way it existed before the pandemic. And so I had to rejigger the book in many ways to be more domestic and more 
um, focus more on the ingredients than on the the people and places that these drinks came from. And, mm. and so it was sort of a rejiggering during the pandemic. And then there was, you know, I also, I think that the social justice movements and the sort of call outs in our industry really had, to, I had to like wade through that before I could, um, you know, write something that, that was going to be, that was going to stand the test of time. I, I think that our whole industry changed dramatically during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to write something that didn't feel like a before book. I wanted to write a book that would embrace what we, what we could learn during the pandemic and would be, a, a, you know, enduring after it. Mm. So how much, when it comes to how much work it was, like there's a deep dive on coffee, deep dive on sugars, all these sort of things. How much was like more research, like um, I'm trying to put this right, like research just in like study books and stuff like that. And how much was, okay, I'm going to go to a coffee shop and taste 15 different styles of coffee and different roast car styles and take make this different sugar these different sugars and use these different herbs how much is more hands all tactile stuff over just regular research the rest so f once again like the book started as a book about people and places so for me it was mostly like like reaching out to folks who i knew knew were experts or knew were people i wanted to feature getting their recipes and then really so the the hands-on like figuring out had a lot to do with mostly figuring out these folks recipes like mm. some of these drinks you know like i'd never made tapache before so i had to not only learn how to make rosio sanchez's tapache i needed to learn how to make tapache and like mm. really understand what it was and so and what it wasn't so the hands-on like in the lab part of the book was focused on recipe testing but fortunately like it wasn't a, it's not the Dave Arnold book, you know? So mm. it's not like I was like out there, like with a, you know, testing the, you know, the acidity of everything sugar <laughs> levels and acidity yeah. and like putting it through, you know, like, a, you know, like I wasn't, it's not a lab book. It's mm. more a, um, I tried to make it as sort of serviceable as possible for everyday bartenders and even, even like sort of enthusiastic consumers. Do you think that uh, a book like this is going to reignite that? I think we always romanticize that relationship, especially in restaurant bars or between the bar and the kitchen. You know, you got restaurant bar bartenders like, oh, I really work closely with the kitchen. But do you think this book is going to reignite that relationship and that evolution of like bartender and, and chef? No, I, I, I don't. I, I think that um, I think that what's interesting coming out of the pandemic is we are facing another weird inflection point in, in the zeitgeist, which is there's like a bit of a, I was talking with, uh, with uh, someone about this yesterday, like we are at a weird inflection point now where I think people are drinking less and less and less and less alcohol. And, and so um, in a weird way, I feel like the, there is a, we are not getting coverage in mainstream magazines and newspapers like we used to. Like, mm. like in some ways, there's a, a crisis in in the craft right now. I, in some ways, I feel like, and so I I don't know that like chefs are going to be the like chefs are not going to save us. Like, I think mm. that in some ways, like um, cooking will. Like, I, I guess the, if you know, getting to like you know, I'm sure you've got a lot of questions before you get to the like. The conclusions to this book, but but I will but I'll spoil the plot. I think cooking will save us. Like I, I think that part of what the the book really tries to like put, put a finger on is that making drinks is cooking, and mm. that when we and cooking builds community. And, and I think that when we sort of offload cooking to our grocery store or to our restaurants or to someone else exclusively, I'm not saying you can't go out to dinner or grab a prepared meal when you're, you know, at your lunch at, at your desk at lunch. But I think that interest in cooking and particularly interesting in these culinary beverages, it's they, they're infectious in their um, in the way that they bring you in and in the pleasure that comes from learning how they work and then sharing them with others. Where do you see the industry right now? As you were mentioning, like the that sort of 
people are drinking more people drink less sorry and the non-alcoholic movement is huge like i i saw in chris cardone just the other other week and i personally know that my liquor sales are down like two to five percent but my non-alcoholic beverages are up 37 yeah. over last year it's it's kind of an insane movement and we've been really focusing on non-alcoholic cocktails obviously non-alcoholic spirits are wildly more expensive especially here in canada than regular mm -hmm. spirits i think a bottle of like free spirits bourbon is ten dollars more expensive than my well bourbon yeah. which is just in in insane do you think that the industry is sort of do you think the industry as a whole is seeing this change and making changes and being dynamic about it or do you feel like people are still waiting for the rubber band to snap back and everybody start drinking again i think that our industry is progressive in some ways and is very conservative in others and so i would say that the idea that people who have built their career around alcohol are gonna jettison it you know quickly because there's a trend towards non-alcoholic drinks. I, I don't see that happening. So I would say that we're probably more likely sort of like waiting for the other shoe to drop and for people to start drinking again. But I but I would I would warn those people that I don't think non-alcoholic drinks are going away. And I mm. don't think um we're not going back to the way things used to be. So I, I think that as especially in the on-premise I think that we have to reimagine what happens in our spaces and bring back more of the, I, I, I was talking, it was Jordan Felix I was talking to here about like the, the rise of NA and, and what, mm. you know, this ge younger generations in particular are, are embracing it. And I think that we have to focus more on the occasions and the rituals and the, um, the spaces that we that we operate and i feel like in the same way that a that a proper bar or restaurant owner need eventually we'll get to the point where they understand that if people want to come to your restaurant and drink vodka sodas or drink non-alcoholic beer like that's not it's not your problem like your job mm -hmm. is to make sure the vodka soda is good and the non-alcoholic beer is good like so the the key thing we have to focus on is that people come to your place and have a good time and then tell other people that your place is great and you should go there. So I just feel like the more flexible we can be and the more um, proactive we can be about creating great experiences, I think that the product mix will sort itself out. And that, and that's part of why I wrote this book as well, is I feel like, you know, this book has a lot of like all of these mixtures are used in cocktails and, mm. and frankly, all of them could be used in non-alcoholic drinks too. And the goal is to expand the, you know, the, the sort of palette of beverages that you work with. And, and part of what the end, the beginning and end of the book ponder is a more, in, you know, sort of in, intersectional, expansive view of what what a bar offers and granted not every bar can't offer all the you know mixtures in this book mm -hmm. but there's a lot of inspiration here what was the most exciting chapter you worked on that you know you thought from the outside looking in you were like okay well it's just x ingredient but then you start getting to it and you're like oh okay what is it this ingredient so and you were talking about tapache earlier because obviously tapache has got deep-rooted history everybody everybody's grandma has got a different tapache recipe what was the ingredient that you were like oh i did not realize how deep this thing went the book is separated into ingredients that are that are physical ingredients like there's a dairy chapter mm -hmm. a milk uh, sorry a, a sugars chapter a spices tea coffee there are two chapters ferments and sodas that are i mean granted ferment ferments and sodas could theoretically be viewed as products but they're more categories of 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 ingredients so mm -hmm. they don't fit the rubric of like ingredient and i would say that going back to tapache i would say the ferments chapter was probably the most rewarding to write for me because to be i say this in the introduction like i'd never really fermented mm. before you know on purpose before i started writing this book and so i was really sort of like stressed about writing a chapter on fermentation as a new fermenter and I found both the literature, which Sandor Katz is like the sort of like Dale DeGroff of mm -hmm. modern Western mm -hmm. fermentation. I felt that the literature, especially Sandor's sort of foundational texts, uh, but also others like Julia Skinner's to be really like 
wonderful. Like I like there was no it was easy to get interested in ferments because there's such great inspiring literature out there about it. The the other thing I found was that the community of people that ferment are, you know, very generous. And I feel like the process of fermentation, like which I didn't know before I started making kombucha, like you use this SCOBY to, to make kombucha. <laughs> and when you're done with your batch, you have another SCOBY. And if you're yeah. done with your next batch, you have another SCOBY. And pretty soon you're like, have tons of SCOBYs. And so the process of making kombucha, for instance, is fascinating in that like, you benefit from having friends or having someone to offload these SCOBYs to by making kombucha. So it's like a process of addition that you benefit from building community around. And, and, and I would say the other thing that was really kind of like new to me and kind of cool is like, you know, most of the drinks we make, we are like the captain of the ship. Like we, mm. you know, the drinks go as we go. Whereas like fermentation relies on a mutualism with bacteria, you know, yeast and, and, and basically these, these living organisms, which transform what you're making into something else. And you, you know, the heat or the acidity or the light or the, you know, type of ingredients you give them, you know, tell you like that determines the outcome of the ferment. So I found that like having these like little buddies that I like didn't know and I was getting to know from batch to batch, I really enjoyed. It was like having a, like a pet, you know, like a goldfish or something <laughs> like, like an that. Old school you, Tamag old school Tamagotchi. You like, like literally <laughs> like walk into your kitchen and like, yeah, that's the other thing. It takes like, you know, sometimes if it's cool, like it might take 10 days to get mm -hmm. through, you know, a fermentation. And I think that was the other thing is like this idea of slowing down and like things mm -hmm. slowing down to the point that you have to wait like 10 days for an outcome. Like in it, we work in an instant gratification world and, and behind the bar, there's so much pressure to get our drinks out fast that I love the way ferments slowed me down. And so I just, I feel like that was the chapter that like, I went in with a lot of trepidation and sort of like imposter syndrome. And I still like, I'm not like by any means, any, you know, no one should ask me any questions about fermentation, but I'm happy with the chapter I wrote. People who know about fermentation are not mad at me. And I felt like I met a lot of cool little friends in that chapter. Do you make kombucha all the time now? Is it something that has kept going post book? It's funny. I'm, I've made lots and lots of batches of it. And my son Arlo loves kombucha, but inevitably the SCOBY would get into the, the, like in like the, the sort of, it's a bit of a gelatinous thing. Mm. And Arlo would be like drinking his kombucha and there'd be like a big, <laughs> chunk of uh, scoby that goes in his mouth and so the problem i have with making more kombucha is like my daughter like was grossed out by the scoby and my son likes it but like he i think i fed him too much scoby and he's a little dubious about it so i, I feel like i don't have i don't have enough help around the house to keep my batches going but but i'll it'll be back jimmy hen jimmy hen kombucha coming to pdx soon seriously there's a the PDX is, has a lot of kombucha. Like yeah, I would have to bring. This is not a. This is not a community in need of more ferments. Yeah. Well, we have it on the island too. Like the amount of like kegs of kombucha that get sent out. Like people have kombucha on tap. Yeah, sort exactly. Of deal. Yeah. Um, with you were talking about climate change and the climate crisis, and obviously that is affecting us. I don't think the the direction of sustainability is obviously a big one this is the meeting summit in uh madrid now madrid no in spain for um paradiso does a sustainability thing how much does the bartender's pantry tie into that sort of pushback against climate change that that sustainability model that I, I know a lot of people are trying to follow how does that fit into the play for that and how does that for philosophy for you sort of play out when it comes to sustainability I think that the that was something I grappled with throughout the course of the book and I continue to grapple with as just a citizen of the earth. And I think where I've begun, where like where I'm at right now, which will change, um, is that it's hard for me to equate food service establishments as like wastes free or as mm -hmm. sustainable there's something that feels 
inherently unsustainable about the amount of waste that a bar or a restaurant or, you know, like a food service establishment generates. And part of that is because we as food or beverage folks are not in charge of all the inputs as far as like where we source our ingredients. Like, mm -hmm. it, like it's hard to buy olive oil or vodka in a, in a, you know, climate friendly package, or mm. it's hard to get it shipped to us in a climate friend, you know, using climate friendly fuels. So the thing that I like sort of thought a lot about as I was there, there, there are economic sort of equations that I was kind of like working through throughout this book. And as far as like thinking about the cost benefit analysis of all of it, like, why should I spend 10 days making tapache? Why mm -hmm. should I, how should I think about the sustainability of drinks? I mentioned that, for instance, like uh, in the fruit chapter that, you know, Douglas Ankara could never have known that the porn star martini would become a global phenomenon. Mm. And, you know, and that passion fruit might be farmed in, you know, you know, like that forests might be torn up in Brazil to plant, plant passion fruits, to grow enough passion fruits for, you know, that it may become the next guacamole basically. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like part of my, where I'm at with sustainability is that as bar operators, not in control of most of our inputs, we should be mindful of what we put on our menus, for instance, and, and like, what is the sort of carbon footprint that we know about from that ingredient? Like Claire Sprouse, I quoted in the grains chapter, talking about the amount of water it takes to grow, say, pistachios mm -hmm. versus almonds versus, you know, peanuts. And so part of it starts in investigating how these things are made and really understanding which are more or less wasteful than the others. But I think more importantly, and where I don't see anyone, where I don't see the conversation going, which I think would, which I would like to steer it towards, is I think when we're talking about sustainability, I think that we all know that like, our world as it's currently constituted is unsustainable, and that we are currently consuming more than we, than the planet can tolerate, and that we, and we are doing so to the detriment of our children and future generations. And so I think that getting away from this like greenwashing uh, of like, oh, like we figured out how to make this carbon neutral. So like, it's a worry-free thing, just have as much as you want of it. Like mm. that, that to me is like, I feel like finding, finding uh, quote unquote sustainable ways to make something to facilitate boundless consumption is that to me is like it's a false it's a like yeah it's like a false um equivalency it's like there's something about that that is that just feels very wrong to me mm. and i think that so i think that a when we talk about sustainability are we talking about like reducing our carbon footprint and trying to create more uh, thoughtful ways of con of eating and drinking or are we talking about worry-free eating and drinking because mm. i think that frequently what we're talking about is worry-free eating and drinking and i hate to like bust anyone's bubble here but like that ain't that's never going to be that should never be part of the equation and i think that's where most of the equation goes and and, and the point i'll get to because i i keep burying the lead is that i think that a lot of this boils down to an idea of luxury and when i say that what i mean is that if we think about this idea of like eating or drinking sustainably, we're talking really about luxury. Like, do mm -hmm. I have the luxury of not feeling guilty or anxious about what I'm consuming? And the answer to that question, I would argue, is probably just universally no. Like you don't. Like there's a there's a sort of you know, all of our choices have outcomes. And I and I think that. Knowing that the answer is probably universally no, then the then the only way to re sort of frame this, in my opinion, is to think about like all of what we drink, whether it's coffee or tea mm -hmm. or a daiquiri, as a little luxury and being more mindful of how it's a luxury and, and being more 
present and thankful and moderate about how we enjoy it. And I think that that is, I think when you, when you care and focus on what you're consuming, you will, you will consume more um, thoughtfully and more Mm -hmm. respectfully. And I guess that's where I think that luxury is something that we should be thinking about what we're eating and drinking in, in terms of luxury. And when I say luxury, not like Louis Vuitton, Chanel Mm -hmm. and private jets, more luxury being everyday moments that, that are opportunities for wonder and for gratitude. Yeah. My two big issues with sustainability in the bar world. Cause I, I feel like, I think I practice relatively good practices. I would never say that our bar is a sustainable bar, but um, seeing pictures on social media of like a sustainability bar saying, Oh, here's our latest syrup in a vacuum bag. And right. I'm like, <laughs> Okay, you kind of you're kind of killing the purpose here. Like, oh, we we process this down; and it's in three vacuum bags. I'm like, the one use plastic, awesome. And I think for sustainability as well on the on the culture side, like, I know it's a bigger problem in the US than here in Canada. Canada's a little bit better when it comes to minimum wage for workers and medical benefits and stuff like that. But in the US, it's some states are and say some states in the US, the minimum wage for people who work in the service industry is very very minimal. So like you're talking about sustainability practices in the kitchen and the bar, but then culturally speaking for the people that are working there, it's not really sustainable for them. Nope. No. And like, for instance, like you may have a great recycling program and then the garbage truck that picks it up, picks up your recycling and then puts it mm-hmm. in a landfill because the city doesn't, you know, have, does it hasn't like, yes. you know, it's like, it's one of those things like the, yes, the, the infrastructure whether it be city, state, country, it just, it's not, it's not there. Mm. It blew my mind in Singapore because Singapore is such a massively cosmopolitan next level futuristic city. And when we are, when I opened bars there, it was like, where do we have our bottle bins? And they're like, what do you mean bottle bins? Cause in, in Canada, we have a very big hardcore like recycling program. And they're like, just chuck it in the trash. I'm like, what? Yeah. But apparently I did find out later on that they actually have people at the, at the landfill before it gets thing that actually do the trash and separate the plastics and the bottles from the trash. And I was like, that seems very labor intensive for something you could just have a different box full. It's interesting though. Like it does seem very labor intensive for us, but think of how many people are like what, what a lot of people don't understand is that if you like put, you know, like if you put, if you, if you're a green little heart, just wishes everything could be recycled and you put like every single type of plastic in the plastic recycling, like it contaminates the, the, the stuff that can be recycled. So there is like a not trusting people to separate the, the, you know, refuse and trusting professionals to do it. So I feel like it's like, uh, that was another big part of this book is just sort of examining my biases as a Westerner throughout the course of the whole Mm. book. And I think that's been, still have they're still there where do you see the book fitting into the future of cocktail like if we if we could like crystal ball the next 10 years because we've both been doing this for a really long time we've seen a lot of different changes we've seen you know dale de groff like when dale re-released his book he changed up some recipes because it went from a liter of sugar and a liter of water makes simple like 50 50 simple syrup sort of deal how do you see your book sort of changing and the 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 industry as a whole changing over the next 10 years Honestly, like I'm without sounding, uh, without sounding depressing, uh, (laughs) a lot is up in the air right now. You know, Mm. like we've got this election going on and we've got these like wars going on and we've got um, a lot is, uh, I think that we are in, I, I don't know, it's in a weird way, like we are things in our world could get much better in the next 10 years or much worse. And going back to this idea of luxury, like this world that you and I have had the great privilege to be a part of for the past few decades, like it's, this is the luxury business. Like this is not like people don't need craft cocktail bars when, you know, they're living in a tent city. So Mm. I, I just think that like, we're living in a second gilded age when, you know, wealth has been like the, the, the things need to get like people who have all the power and money 
need to chill off the power and the money just a little bit and let everyone like sort of breathe and like kind of release their grip on other people's necks so that like things can chill out a little bit. And I think that if that happens, the party can keep going. But if that doesn't happen, like this is all, uh, this is all whipped cream and sprinkles and cherries. So I feel Mm. like the ice cream needs to stay cold. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I don't usually get into politics, but yeah, with the American election, we're probably going to have a Canadian election in the next six months as well. So like all in North America is going to flip on its head possibly. Um, You've accomplished so much over the last like what 30 years. I won't say the exact years that you've been doing this. How do you keep pushing boundaries and, and keep wanting to like write another book and write another book? Because like the bartender's manual was like, for me, the epitome of like your skill set and everything you did. And then when you brought this, I was like, I'm a little bit jealous. I'm just like, how does he keep like just coming up with the ideas that like ground breaks a whole different section of bartending that people don't think about? How do you keep pushing those boundaries? I stay curious. I think that like, um, I mean, one of the reasons why I write the books is because people buy them. Like I, I'll have to just say like the, the first two books were commercial successes. This one has been a pretty slow build. And and if people don't buy this or read it, or if it doesn't, you know, like this, writing books is a great privilege that I have because the books sell and because people put them on their back bars and write reviews of them and give them awards and invite me on their podcast. So I, I'll say like, <laughs> the, this all this can all go away if this book doesn't sell, doesn't get awards, doesn't get reviews, doesn't get put on bars. <laughs> Um, so in in some ways, like the success of the, of these things sort of fuels the opportunity for new things. And so I've been very, I think that like, I'm curious, A, and I'm lucky, B. And and I think the combination of being lucky and being curious has created new opportunities for me. And and I think that, uh, if the luck runs out, I, I will remain curious, but if the luck runs out, the platform will go away because I'm not independently wealthy. So I feel like hopefully, you know, people continue. I, I think that it's interesting. Like I, in the same way that, um, I mean, it goes back to service. Like I feel very strongly that I serve the bar community, that I serve our industry, that, that these works hopefully serve the the interests, needs, you know, knowledge, nourishment, inspiration of our industry. And as long as they continue to do that, I will continue to do the work. You know, like I, I feel an obligation to push boundaries, to inspire, to um, kind of reach up and, and bring people along for that ride. Wow. Do you miss bartending? I do, but, but I, it's interesting. I've, I've talked a little bit about this, but, um, and you know, this as a father, Mm -hmm. um, the pandemic, like I pulled the rug out from under my career when I moved to Portland 10 years ago and Portland has pulled the rug out from my career by treating me like a New Yorker for a decade. And (laughs) I did get to open a bar here for a couple of years during the pandemic, um, which sort of is, it closed and is reopened and, um, but to answer your question between me pulling the rug out from under myself and the, and Portland and the pandemic, then pulling the rug out from under me here, I've had this unique opportunity to like be around, particularly with my son being a very young, um, and my daughter also, she's five years older, like, and I feel like this like moment, I moved to Portland because I wanted to be a, a present dad and then mm-hmm. the pandemic and, and my middling success here have helped me really uh embrace that opportunity and i'll say that and 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 as i said you'll know that like your kids are only young once you know Mm -hmm. and after they get to like a certain age and and like maybe move on to go to school or, or move out when they're you know done with high school like not to say that they're like you're done as a parent and and that they're gone and you won't see them anymore but i've I've looked at this opportunity and realized like, if I can like throttle my career enough to keep the lights on and like, kind of like keep our quality of life reasonable and maybe like do less in my, from my career and, and, you know, you know, not keep up with 
our colleagues like I used to. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that I can pull like a Julio Cabrera or a Toby Cicchini or, you know, I see Charles Jolie opening a bar, although he's, he's way far ahead of me from where I am, but I'm hoping like in my like late fifties, early sixties, like Toby and Julio that I can like open a bar and get mm. back behind it. And, and I know that I won't be good, you know, from the get go, <laughs> but if I actually like, you know, commit to that bar like i committed to my career earlier like i'll be fine yeah it's one thing the pandemic changed for me like my daughter's four almost 14 this year and when she was young she didn't really care if dad was around like it wasn't a thing and obviously i worked a lot i was in singapore for six months in 2019 like two three months since um but it's now that she's getting older that she likes me around and the pandemic sort of reset i think so i I say to my wife, like, how the hell did I live in Singapore for six months and be away from you and, and Mila? And then now if I go, I was in San Francisco last weekend for Top Shelf. I'm like, I was away for like two and a half days. I was like, I missed them incredibly. Yeah. And, you know, and like I was cooking last night and Mila came up and gave me a big hug. She's a very tall, very tall, tall girl. I'm not sure where she gets that from, but she gave me a hug because I was cooking. She's like, I like it when you cook and I like it when you're home. And I'm just like, man. Like, how do I, how, how can I ever quantify like traveling again to a point of like what I was doing in 2019? Yeah. And I think that, that those are the moments I think that we, as humans were animals, we, we condition ourselves to believe certain things about our lives and our mm -hmm. careers and our families. And I feel like, you know, I grew up in a household where my parents worked all the time. And so work was their form of loving us. And I, and I truly believe that, but the, the thing that I've learned as in my life is that work does not equal love. Work equals work. Mm. <laughs> love equals love. And, and I just feel like there's just no substitute for presence. And while presence is a luxury as a non-wealthy person, like we have to work too. And mm -hmm. we also ha ideally have to keep our, you know, career you know, at least middling along. But yes, like the opportunity to like, parent in person to be to be a role model or, or just a, a a person in your in your kid's life is it's a luxury that i that i fortunately realize that i that i have to make space for and mm -hmm. unfortunately the the reality is is like if you want to be the best bartender or bar operator in the world you got to be in your bar yeah. all the time there's no you can't be the best dad in the world and like be home every night for dinner and run the best bar in the world because there's somebody out there that is willing to be in their bar every night and be focused and present with their guests. And and I I realized it in New York at PDT, like there was a moment where I realized like there are things going on outside this bar that require my attention and that attention is dragging me away from my attention on the guests. Mm -hmm. And that means I'm not offering the best experience for my guests. And, and and I realized I had coworkers who could do that. And so I got out of the way and I started focusing on those other things. And so I will say it's funny, like, as I've become less relevant, like there's more time I have to focus on the guests because there's less interest in the other things. So I feel like it is like, a, um, it's working out just as I planned it. <laughs> yeah no i i've done the same thing like i don't bartend i haven't bartended for like two years but i'm, I'm still at clies very rarely on the floor i just cover shifts and definitely all the detentions now put onto my bar team which is great like they people come for my bar the bar team that i have um but no one's coming for sean sewell anymore no one's coming to sit at the bar and people come and it's like oh can you make me a drink i'm like dude like I don't, I don't do that anymore. Like you, you getting a drink from me is going to taste the exact same as you got it from one of my guys. I also think that there's, <clears throat> you can, yeah, that is the correct answer. And that's the correct thing to do so that you don't upstage your staff. But I just think that like in the same way that like you and I don't currently make drinks that are at a bar, we can go back and do it. And, mm -hmm. and like, I just think that this idea that your career or your life is this bell curve where you like do something and try to be great and great and great and build your name. And then you just stop, do it and you never do it again. Like mm. that doesn't make any sense. Like, I, I just think, um, the older I get, the more I realize that like so many people, I think in our industry, like, like one of my, the, the woman, Lydia McLuhan, who I, I, um, opened to Kibi with, 
is like literally like one of the most talented people I ever worked with in my career. And she'd always been studying to be an accountant. And then she ended up like leaving when she got a job in an accounting agency. And, um, and that was like the beginning of the end for me at Takibi. <laughs> but, but when she left, you know, her last ship to Takibi, she insisted she would never work in a bar again. And she is a very strong minded person. And so if she says that she's never going to work in a bar again, she probably won't. But, but I think that the sad thing about our industry and others for that matter is that we allow burnout or sort of this, we, we, we don't need to have such hot and cold, you know, views mm. of our industry. Like bartending is a job like tennis is a sport that like you can do late into your life. If you, if you would like to, you just have to keep your body and mind and heart in, in good shape. Yeah, I agree. Like I, I just at late fifties, early sixties and just work the bar when I want to work the bar and, tap out when I want to tap out and just do a basically do pop-ups and guest shifts in my own place for till I retire. Yeah. I, I think also just, I think going to Japan for me has really helped me understand that like, you know, you go to Japan to these, these Ginza bars and you see these like 60 and 70 year old bartenders and they're not, they're not working hundred seat venues. There's mm. 20 seats in their bar. And I just think that like, when I'm 60 or 70, I'm not going to open some big bustling Balthazar like place. I'm going to open a tiny little bar because at 60 or 70, like I'm not going to be making like 50 drinks an hour. I'm mm -hmm. going to be making like 10 or 12. Yeah. <laughs> um, back to the book. Uh, what do you think the, what, what, what would you like the biggest takeaway for bartenders grabbing the bartender's pantry for the first time um, and reading it? What's the biggest takeaway you'd like to see bartenders take away from it? I, I spoiled this sort of plot earlier when I talked about cooking being yeah. community. The the thing that I say in the beginning of the book, which is which which would be a, another answer that's part of it, is that I've seen um, as our industry is professionalized, which is a great thing, that a lot of what people have chosen to differentiate themselves in our increasingly sort of larger and more com um, competitive group, you know, sort of group of colleagues is they've specialized. So like certain people amongst us have decided to be the like mezcal person or the like mm -hmm. wild mezcal person or the like, you know, like they, they, they've just gone down these very deep rabbit holes of knowledge, which I'm not saying that like you shouldn't specialize or that they're, you know, if you're a tiki person or, or, you know, a natural wine person that like that, that you shouldn't have a area of interest that you want to maybe learn more about or become an expert in. But I think that this idea of being a generalist is something, the value of being a generalist, the value of knowing a lot, a little about a lot of things, as opposed to a lot about very few things is something that has gotten lost in our trade. And I think mm. that, um, I think being a bartender is, in my opinion, like a bartender should always be able to speak to a number of different subjects and topics, you know, and, and I think part of the reason, one of the crises we face in our industry on premise is that when people go to a bar, they just sit there on their phone instead of engaging with their guests or with the bartender. Mm -hmm. And I think the antidote to that is like, be more interesting than what's on people's phone. And mm -hmm. like, it, that is the only way you're ever going to get them to put their phone down is to be a compelling alternative to it. And, and I think that that starts with being a bit of a Renaissance person that can speak to any interests that someone has. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with that one. The generalist thing I definitely agree with. Cause like, I feel like it's a very old school sort of bartender thing is like you, when you have a new product, you will learn everything about that new product. Doesn't matter what category it is. And then like, I've just had a couple of new staff start, and I'm like, anything you're looking through the spirit menu, tell me what you're looking at. And I can probably give you like five bullet points about where it's from, how it tastes, how it's made, all that sort of stuff. And, but that's just me. It's just, I'm trying to get the newer generation to like, with you, you have so much information on that cell phone, like at your fingertips that we didn't have back in the day. Like we grew up in an era where like the Chanticleer Society was the biggest deal on, on, online before that was like i'd go into every bookstore and go and look for new 
cocktail books I hadn't seen before and grab one. And I've got 500 books still back in storage back home in Australia that I'll never get here to a here to Canada, but I've still got a massive collection of books here. Yeah, and I think that as back then information was the rarity. Now information is there's too much information. So and granted the challenge is like not all of it is credible. And as with AI and you know like who knows where we're going with that. But I think that now that information is fl we're flush with information, we need to prioritize other things as bartenders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's the plan for the next six to 12 months for Jim Meehan? I, uh, well, as I mentioned, we've got this little election thing going on and these, <laughs> these other things going on in the world, which I'll be waiting to see what happens. Um, I'm not in control of any of those outcomes, so I'm not worried about them, but uh no, I'm worried about them. Um, the next six to 12 months basically looks like um, book promotion. Um, the, a book, one of the things a lot of authors don't realize is that the, you know, this thing comes out and it has like a bit of, there's a media like cycle of about mm -hmm. a year. There's a, um, there's like a sort of bandwidth for, like your book is only new once and mm -hmm. it's going to be new for about a year. And then the next year, other books will come out and, and, and a lot of, you know, attention deservedly. So we'll move on to that. So I will continue promoting this book for the next really until like July, like, like it came out in June. We began promoting it from there on at BCB in Brooklyn and, um, and then at tales. And so like, we'll continue doing that. I have, um, I'm going to terroir in Calgary in a couple of mm. weeks and oh, then nice. I'm going so I'm excited for that. I'm going um, to Seattle and, and Bellingham before that next week. I'm going um, to Japan with Suntory in November. And then I'm going to Mexico City um, to visit my brother from another mother, Nico Meehan, um, who's written three great taco books. And then I got plans to go to North Carolina in January and then Detroit and sort of kind of just keep getting out on the road and sharing this with with folks who I can gather to to sort of check it out. And then other than that, like a, a lot is sort of up in the air. Um, I'm still working with American Express on the Centurion Lounges. Um, I haven't talked about it a ton, but my role at Banks and Bacardi Sunset last year, and I began working with Suntory at the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm working with the uh, global spirits team on uh, advocacy related matters in a marketing capacity. So I'm working on a lot of cool stuff. They have a lot of cool new products coming out that I'm getting uh, in my hands to, to kind of create some drink strategies and, and serves. And um, as I mentioned, I'm going to Japan uh, in a few weeks to, for this dojo summit. So I'm kind of excited to do some advocacy work around uh, Centauri's brilliant and delicious Japanese spirits. Nice. So we're at the stage of the interview that uh, this is something brand new because you've done the show before. Uh, the five deep questions for the end of the for the end of the interview, and I like it because it c catches a lot of guests off guard. I feel like you're so philosophical that I don't think it's going to catch you off guard. But let's get into it. What is the one lesson or experience that has shaped your perspective the most, and how do you carry that forward in life? Hmm. I would say the one thing that has shaped my perspective is the importance of relationships. I, I think that I am not a rich person financially. Well, I am relatively speaking a rich person financially, but but I'm not a millionaire or a billionaire. But I but I am in terms of relationships, and I would say that um, at an early enough age, I realized that like my not only my success, but my enjoyment of my work was predicated upon the richness or lack of richness of the relationships that I that I built and sustained it throughout the course of my career. And as a bartender, I feel like I probably know way more people as far as numbers and know very few of them with enough depth. But that being said, like I, I continue to come back to you know, building relationships, trying to nurture them and trying to grow new ones. And I think that that is something that has served me well. If you could leave one lasting message or piece of wisdom for the world, what would it be and why? Leave it better than you found it. You know, like I feel like that is something that 
uh, all of my mentors have either told me or that their teachings have, you know, sort of that that has been part of their teachings, whether explicit or not. I feel um, we all, all of our work, all of our lives are built upon other people's lives, other people's work, other people's knowledge, wisdom, um, what they gave the world or what they took away. And I think that regardless of, you know, where you started, leaving it better than you found it is a form of stewardship that we should all practice. And if we did that, then the world would be a better place, I think. Looking back on your journey, what is something you wish you had understood earlier in life? I wish I had understood that cocktails are not salad. Uh, <laughs> I drink, uh, I, you know, if I like look back and like I look where I'm at right now, like, there's just a lot, I had a lot of fun, so I don't have any regrets, but I would say to, and it sounds like young people aren't even drinking at all. So like, I would say to you young people aren't even drinking at all, like have a cocktail. But I would say to those who are drinking, like I was drinking when I was young, like I would mm -hmm. sort of say like, Hey, like, let's, let's turn it down a notch so that when you're like in your fifties and forties and fifties, you can still drink. Like I, I, I sort of, you, my my sort of GP right now has has as she's she like has given me the middle age talk a few times the last time I've gone in for physicals and she sort of explains like your body like the miles that you put on your body throughout your course of your life like, mm. like just add up so like if you if you work yourself too hard that's going to show up later so I would say that like moderation and balance are something that like when you're 20 in your early 20s and 30s, you just feel invincible and you just like, you go so hard. And I would just say like, as a like late 40s bartender, like I'm feeling that right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, I've got some football injuries that like, back in when I was in my 20s, I was like, nah, it's fine. And now I'm like, mm, it's not fine. It's not great, <laughs> it's not, not great. great. I rem Oh, I remember that tackle, that was a bad one. How do you find success? How do you define success? And has your definition of it changed over time? Yeah, like I, I think success is very relative. Like, um, and it has changed over time. But that being said, um, I think that that's a great question. There's success as far as the way, like, so identity, for instance, I believe to be something you have your own identity, but your identity is not independent of what others think of you. Like, it's just not. Like, what we are is a byproduct of what we think we are and what we put out in the world and what others think of us. And ideally, in an ideal world, what you think you are is the what it, way other people perceive you. Like, that mm -hmm. is a person whose identity is in pretty good balance. Whereas, like, if you think you're the greatest thing in the world and people think you're a monster, like, you're probably neither, but you're not, you know, one of the two. I would say success is someone like that in that you could be very satisfied with your life and the other people could be like unsatisfied with what you've done with yeah. your life. So I would say that success is a something you're always going to have to be balancing between those who are, you know, evaluating your, you know, what you've done and, and what you think you've done. And I would say that like finding some form of, um, some form of equivalence so that like that you find balance is important. I would also say that given that that's a, that is a tough question. Um, don't believe your own hype. Like I would yeah. say that like, I would, I would veer more towards listening to what other people thought of you than what you think of yourself in that what other people think of you presumably is based on what you've actually done. Mm. And I think that as we get older, and as we like, maybe, especially since we're all more and more online and more and more remote, our own impression of our, of our success or impact in the world can, can easily be outsized from what it is. So like, listen to people, listen to what, not necessarily listen to the hype about you, but listen, um, listen to what people say about you and take that feedback to heart. What do you hope your legacy will be and what steps are you taking to build it? I mean, 
there's my legacy as a father. There's my legacy as a husband. There's my legacy as a son. There's my legacy as a brother. My, I think as I look back on my legacy as a bartender, the funny thing is that, and this is a good one for you young bartenders out there. The reason why I believe that like Sam Ross and Audrey Saunders and a few other bartenders have modern classics under their belts is because they stuck with them. You know, they either didn't have a menu at their bar and, and made sure that, that, that their drinks were one of the top five drinks that their staff recommended and that the drinks were also obviously actually great. Um, but I think that as a bartender, my legacy won't be a modern classic because I moved too quickly through new drinks. Like I've mm. created hundreds of drinks and never given any of them enough time to like really take hold as, as classics. So hopefully like my legacy, it won't it probably won't include a penicillin or, you know, an old Cuban, but hopefully my legacy as a bartender is, um, you know, that I, that I, that I, like you said earlier, like that I just kept pushing and that mm -hmm. I never, and that I always believed in the power of, of what we do as a profession to, to better our society and our world at large. Like I'm, I'm not delusional in the sense that like, as I said before, alcohol is not salad, but bars are important third places in our society. And when they're run um, with integrity and, and care, they, they form important places in people's lives and in communities. They're, they're places like, one of the things I learned about that, that drove me towards wanting to do this for my whole life is bars remain one of the only places in the world where a politician, an actor, an athlete, a school teacher, a garbage truck driver, and, and a, you know, a norm, like another bartender can all sit in the same room and and talk to each other like they're anyone can talk to anybody in a bar and that's just in the in the cast like world stratified world that we live in it's unusual uh and special and i think it's something worth preserving jim i want to say thank you so much for your time like i, I said at the start like i still get giddy like i still look back and i was 26 when i moved to canada and I think I was in New York in 27 and I was just like still in awe whenever I get to sit down with people and like hang out. We, we hung out in Montreal a couple of months ago. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. For everybody, The Bartender's Pantry, you got to get a copy. It's a fantastic, fantastic book. Keep Jim in the lifestyle he's become accustomed to. <laughs> and uh, But no, it would, dude, congratulations on the book. It's beautifully, beautifully illustrated. Like every single detail is just absolutely awesome if you want to geek out about ingredients it's the best way to go yeah and i haven't mentioned emma jansen um but this book wouldn't exist without emma jansen um her you know she kind of like took me on midway through it and really helped me get a lot of these points across so i feel like yeah as you mentioned like bart sasso's illustrations emma jansen helping me co-write this aj meeker's like beautiful photos it was very much like a team effort and and obviously like 10 speed helped us make a beautiful book so it's not just me. It's a bunch of other people yeah, right. that, that helped me get here. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time, my friend. I'll see you very soon. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the great okay. question, Sean. Nice no, to talk. Thanks, man. It's always good to see you. Cheers. Thanks for listening, Pose Shifters. I well, hope you enjoyed that episode. I really enjoy sitting down with friends and peers and uh, just chatting about the industry and getting down to the nuts and bolts of what's really going on out there. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, comment, everything on all the platforms. Just hit it up and I'll do my best to answer any queries or questions you have. I'll see you next week, guys. Bye.